So welcome to uh, this cafe. Uh, as we enter Sangok September 2022, uh, we start uh, with uh, one of our own events here in this cafe uh, in, with a discussion with the winners of the Sangok September Awards 2021. And as I pointed out, we've got uh, uh, the disappeared from my screen. Ah, yeah, he has disappeared from everyone's screen because he is in an empty room. We've got one of the previous winners of Sidewalk September with us as well from 2020, Carlos Queiroz. Um, and we have, uh, but we have no less in the cafe today, no less than six guests uh, with, well, no, sorry, uh, we have five because we seem to have missed uh, um, Cliff. Uh, so let's hope that Cliff still shows up. Uh, he would be the sixth guest. But I'll introduce him anyway, but I'll first uh, mention, so what I'll do, I'll introduce the guests and then um, uh, every uh, one of these will present some of their work, some of their philosophy, maybe show a little video. Uh, and if you have uh, uh, questions that are specifically on clarifying something that one of the speakers has mentioned, please throw in those questions, but uh, questions and answers which warrant longer responses are going to go to uh, the end of the presentation so that everyone will have time to, uh, to present their work. Um, it will be about uh, 15 minutes per piece, and we've got four pieces with six guests, uh, or hopefully six guests. Um, and the first is uh, Daryl Grant. Uh, he started off uh, as an accomplished pianist, uh, which included in the 1990s a New York Times 10 jazz album, but that's a very long time ago. And since then, uh, he has driven pianos deep into U.S. state forests to support the environment. He has arranged protest anthems and shared the stage with no one less than Archbishop Desmond Tutu, uh, which I find very impressive. I lived in South Africa for two and a half years uh, while he was still active politically. Uh, amongst other things, he currently is a professor of music at Portland State University, and that is in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and last year he created Come Sunday, uh, which is a beautifully orchestrated and thought out portrait of the rich cultural heritage of Portland, Oregon. Uh, also with us is Sarah Tiedemann. Do I say this right, Sarah? Uh, she is the artistic director of Third Angle New Music, who commissioned Daryl's work and also a number of other really nice pieces. But we thought, uh, or the jury, sorry, uh, last year thought that uh, uh, Daryl's work uh, stood out uh, amongst those pieces. And she's a musician herself. And one remarkable performance, uh, at least uh, in my uh, eyes, is uh, a 2004 world premiere of Derek Jacobi's Flute Concerto. Now, is this the same Derek Jacobi who played I, Claudius? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, this is, this oh. is a, a, an American one. Yeah. <laughs> he okay. does enjoy getting mixed up, though. <laughs> Now I am less impressed. Oh, that is because of, I do not know this. Derek <laughs> He's a Jeopardy. great guy, but not, <laughs> but not, not I, Claudius. Not okay. <laughs> uh, we also have with us uh, Viv Coringham, uh, who is a uh, who is a singer, walker, and listener who hails from the land of Listras. She was uh, just discussed, Listras, not Viv Coringham, uh, and is avoiding the UK hubbub by being based in New York, Long Island, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, she has led workshops on listening and sounding in no less than three continents. Uh, and that doesn't even include South America, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so um, there's that. Uh, and in her work, uh, Where Am I? She captured the disjointed experience of physically being in space as our thoughts drift and take us elsewhere. And we also have with us uh, on one screen, Amanda Drago and Kit Hay, or Hay. Which one is it? Mr. Mute, it's, it's Haig. We pronounce the G. I don't know why the H is there at the end. It doesn't do anything at all. So it's Haig. I should have asked this before, right? But uh, I always assume that I'm not. And then, uh, then I have to say it. And then it turns out that I'm not totally sure. So Chris, hey, Kit Haig and Amanda Drago. And they're both of Greencroft Arts, which is a not for profit offering arts, culture, and well being activities to visitors and rural communities on the Northumberland Cumbria border, which is in northern England. And set in that area, last year they created a piece called Collision and Conflict, which is a deftly considered, constructed, I would say, sound walk that steps us around a section of Hadrian's Wall. Uh, so now we are connecting uh, that story with Claudius, right? Um, through the eyes, ears, and hearts of 14 commissioned artists. And uh, I don't see 
Cliff with us, which is a pity. Uh, if he shows up, uh, he would be the last guest uh, in today's... Um, there he is. What timing, Cliff. Wonderful to see you. I was just about to introduce you, um, but I already introduced... Uh, hi, Cliff. I just I'm, I'm just about to introduce you. And so your timing is impeccable. Um, uh, I did already introduce the other guests, but now it's just you left. Um, and that is, uh, well, as you see, we have just been joined by Cliff Andragi, who is a visual artist based in Bristol, whose work revolves around the exploration of his lived experience of migration and split identity. And I'm sure he'll tell us a little bit about this in a minute. Um, and uh, with that, the issues that intersect with that experience, specifically issues of class and mental health. And last year, Cliff uh, created or put together a piece called Bristoler Chronic, which explores issues of identity, biography, and class by wandering through the neighborhood of his former home uh, and connecting this to his current place of residence in Bristol while reflecting on his experience, experiences excuse me, as a student at university. So it's quite a shopping list of uh, uh, wonderful creators with us. So as I said, uh, we'll have each of them present a little bit about their work, about themselves, about their philosophy, about their ideas, uh, each uh, 15 minutes or so. And then uh, we'll move into a Q&A. &A. Uh, and I would like to invite uh, Daryl uh, and or Sarah to start. Okay. Um, well, welcome, everyone. And uh, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Um, well, it's really uh, it's a privilege to be here and to be connected with this community around this unique wor work. This is my first uh, sound walk, uh, and I was fortunate to be commissioned by uh, Third Angle New Music, which is an incredible um, organization that presents all kinds of relevant um, new music in Portland and sort of nationally and internationally known uh, artists and commission new work. And this is the second thing that I did for them um, in 2020, 2018. <laughs> uh, they commissioned me to write. Uh, it depends a, on. Yeah, depends to write a chamber opera, um, and that was uh, that was a piece called Sanctuaries, and Sanctuaries was a jazz chamber opera exploring the history of Portland's black neighborhood um, in. You know, sort of very briefly, um, Oregon and Portland have a very unique and peculiar history with relation to um, African Americans, black people. Um, one of the few states that uh, had in their constitution, the state constitution, that it was illegal for black people to reside in the state. Um, and for a long time, Portland had a number of um, prejudicial rules and ordinances, um, and particularly with, uh, with uh, as, as it concerned housing. So Northeast Portland, um, because of uh, legislation, policies, customs, was the only area in which black people were allowed to live in Portland. So that was sort of the heart of the black community. And um, in the late 20th century into the 21st century, um, gentrification um, meant the sort of um, the loss of uh, that, that neighborhood for the community. So Sanctuaries was based on that. Um, and the Soundwalk Come Sunday was kind of a follow-up on that. I noticed in sort of looking at the neighborhood that it was incredibly full of churches. Um, at one time in Northeast Portland, there were over 200 black churches in a, in a fairly small radius. And um, most of them you know, were, were empty. There were still some functioning ones. And I thought it would be really interesting um, interesting subject for Soundwalk to take people on a tour of these black churches. Um, and so I did uh, a, a several months of research, just which involved walking around the neighborhood myself and, you know, talking to people and getting histories. And so Come Sunday wound up being a combination of, um, you know, walk amongst these churches. Um, it combined um, spoken oral histories of neighborhood residents, some of whom were pastors, some of whom were, you know, grew up in the neighborhood about the influence of the black church in the neighborhood. Um, I also had black artists from the community sing spirituals um, the, of their choice and the sort of those were tagged to each of the, the different um, stops, the 15 stops along the, the sound walk. So I had that. And then there was also original music and spoken word and text um, that put together. And the, the idea was that, you know, it was taking people through three neighborhoods and it was kind of a, a, a pilgrimage through those neighborhoods um, that were once the heart of Oregon's largest black community. Um, it started at a park 
um, called the, Nor the Norval Unthank Park, which was um, named for the very first black doctor in Portland. Um, and it uh, ended at um, uh, Bethel AME Church, which is the oldest continuously operating black church in Oregon. Um, and it passed 13 houses of worship and uh, sort of shared a bunch of that history and, um, and uh, really inspired people to think about, um, I was trying to get people to think about the, the sort of impact of systemic racism on that neighborhood and to reimagine that neighborhood if it were still now a center of black community in the same way that it was. Um, so that's it. I think I, maybe um, if you want to, Bubba, if you want to play one of the clips, I have like a, a couple of 30 second clips that sort of were previous to the walk that you can get a little sense. So anyone, I think number one is fine. All right, we'll start with uh, the first one. Uh, this and then. Precious Lord, take my hand and lead me on and let me stand. I am tired. I am weak. And I am worn through the storms, through the night. Lead me on. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, some incredible, incredible performers from the jazz tradition, the gospel tradition. Um, and, you know, as I, I, I got to neighbor, know this neighborhood so well in the months of walking and counting the steps, as I know those of you who've made those walks, just trying to figure out how, how long it takes to get from one place to another, <laughs> counting and making a log of all the steps and, you know, how many and uh, to get to one place or another. And it was, it was an incredible experience to create and Sir, I don't know if you want to um, add anything about your, you know, how that fit into the sound walks that you guys do. Sure. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Daryl. <laughs> Every time I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you for hosting this and, and for recognizing Daryl's work. Um, so I'm Sarah Tiedemann. I'm the artistic director of Third Angle, as was mentioned. Um, we've been around for over 35 years. I've lost track of the exact number. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. And Third Angle has kind of evolved to have three different legs to what we do. We uh, started out as a performing ensemble doing contemporary classical music. Um, and we're kind of a modular ensemble at this point that pulls in different performers for different pieces. Um, we also function as a presenting organization. And we've kind of um, expanded this third leg of what we're doing, which involves more installations and these sound walks. Um, we've always done a lot of interdisciplinary collaborations with dancers, um, artists, fashion, and we've had specifically an, uh, a music and architecture series called Frozen Music, um, where we've done things at the uh, Mount Angel Abbey here has a, a kind of random to be there library designed by Alvar Alto. So we did um, a program of finished works and had the resonant frequency of a stairwell there playing. Um, we had people walking around uh, reciting all of our quotes. Um, so we've done things related to place for a long time. Um, I would say about half our concerts of each season are site specific. And we kind of took that in this new sound walk direction when the pandemic hit. It was kind of funny. We had a concert at the beginning of March with Caroline Shaw. And the day after the concert, we had our first sound walk, not knowing exactly what was happening. Uh, and so that was kind of a guided live sound walk exploring a more industrial neighborhood in Southeast Portland. Um, and the pandemic hit and no one could <laughs> attend live shows. So we decided one way we could continue programming and give people a way to get out into the world um, and have sonic experiences while they couldn't come to actual shows 
would be to create a sound walk program um, in partnership with Portland Parks. So each month, a different park was featured and a sound walk was created by a different artist. Um, Daryl was obviously one of those. Uh, and we had a pretty wide variety in um, composers and sound artists who we commissioned um, in the parks that they chose and the ways that they chose to approach that. So um, their work and also one that I did had a lot of um, context socially and historically with the place where we were interacting. Um, some people took a very physical experience with the space. Someone um, did one at our famous International Rose Test Garden here in Portland and hooked up little electrodes to the roses and created a soundscape of the electrical impulse coming from the roses. Um, so there was a little bit of everything and it was interesting. Um, we had several people comment to us that uh, in all the cases, but particularly in the ones that had voices, um, there was a sensation of not being alone on the walk. And we hadn't really expected that to be such a high point of the sound walks, but with people feeling so isolated and doing these walks solo, and downloading the mp3 in the map and just kind of going when when it works for them to have other voices in your ear actually ended up tying them to the community um and they were quite popular i think maybe carissa or mario could weigh in i think we had just thousands of people coming to our website downloading the tracks for free um and getting out maybe to some Portland parks that they hadn't explored before and to neighborhoods that they hadn't explored before. So it ended up being an experience that brought new new people into our organization. Um, and we've just heard a lot of feedback that uh, it helped people get through the pandemic to have those sonic experiences where they felt together when they couldn't be experiencing music live in a concert hall. So, um, I think Daryl's in particular was really meaningful to us because we have been planning on uh, premiering sanctuaries for ages and it was the biggest project in our organization's history and then to have it uh, delayed was pretty heartbreaking. Um, and so to have this kind of expansion of what we were, what we were trying to do um, by bringing attention to the neighborhood, by giving people a chance to be heard and, and tell their stories. And also, Daryl's just really good at what he does. So we were happy to, to give people a chance to hear his work in the meantime. Um, and I think when we did get around to the actual performance that we're, we're about up on the one year anniversary awesome. of it right now, um, yeah. I think it added a lot of meaning uh, because people had physically explored the neighborhood. And then we were able to offer this um, opera outdoors, right in the middle of the epicenter of everything, um, where part of the neighborhood had been sort of bulldozed to put a freeway and the sports complex um, where our basketball team plays right in the middle of it. So uh, having that view very specifically of kind of ground zero of what has happened was really meaningful. And I think it hit a lot of people in a new way. Um, and as, as those of you who've listened to Daryl Soundwalk know, it's also just beautiful and um, enjoyable to listen to. I would say for folks who aren't near the places where they can walk, it's still worth just listening to at home. It's quite the experience. So we're really grateful to Daryl. We love working with him. He's in the family now. <laughs> um, so that's yeah, the, the piece welcome. very much stands on. Thanks, Sarah. The piece very much stands on its uh, own merit as well. It uh, clearly unlocks um, uh, the place that it uh, that it features uh, in the in the piece, but it doesn't require the listener to be in the place to uh, to appreciate and. Uh, the work, um, because it, it's really is a fantastic piece to listen to also because of the. Uh, uh, the wonderful music that's part of the um, part of the work. Uh, as we move towards the 15 minute mark, I've got one question for Daryl. Mm -hmm. um, because Sarah already said that the uh, what was it, 10 uh, artists that were commissioned were specifically commissioned 
to focus on uh, particular locations. So uh, uh, it was about unlocking these locations in one way or the other. But Daryl, did you have, when you created the piece, a particular audience in mind who would be consuming the work that you were creating? Um, well, not necessarily. I mean, I think, so the, because this was an urban area um, and so densely populated, like this is a, is, this is a place that people would walk. I mean, a lot of the audience for Third Angle New Music, but also just, you know, it's one of the most populous parts of Portland. So it was really about, I think, the the people that live, like for the black community, it was a play, it was a way of celebrating the past and sort of remembering and restoring the memory of the past. For the white community, it was an eye opening. I mean, they passed by, by these buildings every day. And they wouldn't have they wouldn't have necessarily thought about the history or who was there or why they were there. And so, um, so I think it was it was really for the city as a whole that that audience. Mm -hmm. And what is left of these communities now? Because you go back into the past of these communities, but and you say that one of the churches is the longest operating black church in right. Was it the United States, right? Uh, um, in, or in Oregon, actually. Uh, in Oregon. Maybe yeah. Uh, well, yeah, so in some of them some of them are still active churches. Um, and the, the sort of the difficulty and the challenge is that um, their congregations don't live in the neighborhood. They were neighborhood churches for the community, and now the community has been pushed out to the suburbs. And so a lot of them still come back. I mean, in Sundays, they'll come back into the neighborhood, they'll bring the children there. Um, and then others are vacant. And those, those are the ones that are really interesting to me, the ones that I walked by for months and I, weeks and I couldn't find any information about who was there. And, and then sometimes serendipitously, I'd run into someone and be like, oh, yeah, that was so-and-so's uncle's church. And then I would, then I would get to talk to them. And, and uh, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're still, I'd say, there's this latent energy um, in those spaces. That, and I think as, as we move t more towards, you know, sort of this dismantling of, of the systemic racism in our in our city and our country, um, we start to we those places are starting to be reexamined, and I'm hoping will be restored to the community. So so there's that energy happening too. I hope you're right uh, on that systemic racism is being dismantled in the United States. Uh, looking into <laughs> the United well. States from the outside. Yeah. <laughs> pockets, pockets, efforts and pockets, yes. Yeah, there, there definitely is a certain drive uh, towards that, but there is, I would say, also a drive in the opposite direction. Um, oh, always. But, you know. So, yeah, and who's winning, right? It's, but, mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, if uh, yeah. the audience uh, hasn't listened to uh, Come Sunday, I really recommend it, uh, because as, as it was mentioned, uh, uh, it's, it can be consumed everywhere. Uh, it doesn't require you to be in Portland. Uh, thanks. Uh, if you have questions, uh, leave them till the end. Uh, I'd like to move to uh, Viv. Viv, um, uh, tell us uh, about uh, your wonderful piece. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good to be here. That, that was wonderful work, by the way, Dal. I'm looking forward to hearing more of it. Um, yeah, so for, I made what I call the dislocated sound walk, which asks, where are we when we walk? Uh, are we actually here in the place that we're walking through? Or are we somewhere else, lost in our thoughts and memories of other times and places? So this is actually quite a playful and sort of almost dreamlike sound walk, which you can do anywhere, including indoors. Um, and it's available as a sound file on the um, Walk, Listen, Create website. So uh, I'm not going to actually play any of it today, but I will I'll say more about the work and the background to it. But first, I'd just like to start by telling you a bit about my practice generally, because it might make a bit more sense of what I'm doing. So I work as um, an improvising vocalist and um, a walking sound artist. And I'm very interested in working with communities and their sense of place, um, especially very familiar places and how this all relates to memory and personal history. So. Um, also, I, I worked and studied for many years with the late musician, composer and humanitarian Pauline Oliveros, and I trained in her practice of deep listening, which is really about listening to everything all the time, no matter what you're doing. <laughs> Easy, no? <huh? laughs> one of her pieces that I really love um, has a very simple one line instruction. Take a walk at night, walk so silently that the bottoms of your feet become ears. 
Anyway, I'd like to tell you about a little bit about my ongoing 20 year project called Shadow Walks. And I do apologize for those of you who, who've heard quite a lot about it in the past in these cafes, but it's sort of, uh, it feels important to mention it. So it's occurred in Asia, the Americas, Europe, and Australia. Um, and it asks the question that if a walk is repeated over and over again, does it become meaningful for the person who walks, almost as though they left some part of themselves there? And if a person walks through certain places regularly along the same route, does that act of walking impose a trace that can be mapped across the time and space? So shadow walks in a sense is an attempt to make a person's traces, their shadow, audible through my own singing, improvising voice. And this is the process. I go to a new place um, and I find local people who are willing to take me on a walk that has some significance for them. We walk together. I record their words, uh, well, conversations and the environmental sounds. And then I go back along the same route exactly on my own. And this time I try to remember the walk and really get a sense of those traces, which I then sing with wordless improvisations. Um, and I select from the hours of recording I get doing this, um, and I coll uh, collage things together to become the final work, the shadow walk, which I present as a mixture of things really, audio walks that other people can take, sometimes as geolocated iPhone walks, or quite commonly as installations in galleries or maybe around a town. Anyway, in 2016, I took a new direction with the presentation of Shadow Walks and started making multi-channel installations and performances. Um, I had a very nice year-long residency with a place called Harvest Works, which is a digital media lab in New York, of which I've actually I've got the same residency this year. Um, and it really kind of got me into working with multi-channel. And one of the pieces I made was called Shattered Song Shadow City. For this work, uh, I performed live with a six speaker installation. And this, the installation is playing fragmented stories and soundscapes from walks that I did with people in five different countries. And the reason I decided to make it so fragmented um, was because it was 2016, a very stressful and difficult year. Trump got in, Brexit got through. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in Brussels where there'd been a bombing which had led to the division of people really. Um, so some of the work, words in the work were related to displaced people and the difficult situation. And so I wanted the work itself to create a sense of dislocation in the audience too. And I did that by breaking up the stories and breaking up the sounds that I recorded from the environment. Um, so the stories were quite separated from the recordings of the places. Anyway, that was this sense of dislocation that I was looking for really brings me to the work, Where Am I? A Dislocated Sound Walk. So part of the reason I decided to make this was my own frustration <laughs> at the way my mind wanders on a walk. And I sometimes find that I've missed huge chunks of time and <laughs> I've forgotten completely where I was walking. Because for example, I saw something which reminded me of an experience on a different walk or a different place. And I went there in my mind. So I sort of berated myself for that for a while. But then I decided to just stop berating myself for my lack of mindfulness and kind of enjoy it. Enjoy all these layers of different places and, <laughs> and thoughts that were happening. And so what happens in this piece is that each person takes a walk um, about 20 minutes long, somewhere familiar to them. And they listen to my audio guide and they find themselves in unfamiliar territory, wandering through very unlikely places listening to sounds and creatures that don't belong together. Um, with a description of a route that moves between city and country, even passing one, at one point through a Tokyo train station onto a Long Island beach. And accompanying all this misguidance are fragments of my singing and sometimes a remark from someone in one of the places that I've recorded. 
oh, let's turn left and go and look at my grandma's house, is one of them. Listening prompts and questions that I give um, might trigger memories. For instance, can you remember a sound from your childhood? Or they might trigger imagination. Can you imagine the sound of a flock of birds arriving from a distance? Or sometimes the prompts are there just to bring you right back to the present moment, such as what is the quietest sound you can hear now? So I've been interested in dislocated and interrupted works actually for a long time. I realized when I started to think about what I was gonna to say today, I realized this isn't something that's just come upon me. <laughs> I've been doing these dislocated walks since 1999, when I was asked to create a sound walk for a very specific walk that went by the beach in Fremantle, Australia. I was given a map with the estimated walk times shown for each section. So I superimposed this map over a map of central London, where I walked and recorded myself describing what I saw. Uh, with a background of busy London street sounds, which were then going to be heard in the quiet area of Fremantle. Then in 2001, I created another guided sound walk um, for headphone listening and walking. The route followed London's Lost Fleet River. You know, London has a lot of lost rivers. This was the River Fleet. But suddenly it takes a detour through a Turkish village that I know very well and where I'd record it. Uh, and I made an accompanying map to, which also shows this detour. <laughs> so you were sort of on your own for that bit. Then in 2018, I worked for a month in Bangalore with art students. And we did a lot of sound walking, sometimes in silence, sometimes where we listened and responded to what we heard. Um, I sent them out to take solo or small group walks and, and map them in such a way that they became a kind of musical score that another group could follow. And they used remembered walks too, creating sound works based on their own hometowns, because a lot of them were not from Bangalore. And I'm very interested in using this imagination and memory when I lead a sound walk. So for the final public sharing, we created a walk where I led an unsuspecting group of sound walkers through a park in Bangalore, uh, in which my students had kind of hidden themselves in various places and were playing recordings of very unlikely animal and bird sounds. <laughs> and at one point, they're doing various actions. Uh, yes, at one point, a group, you could hear a group arriving on horseback. And then when they came, they were very seriously playing coconut shells. So it, yeah, it was kind of right on that threshold of reality and performance, which I liked a lot. And I'll just end up by um, saying what I've been doing since the award, because in the last year I've been extremely busy. I've had three artist residences <laughs> all running simultaneously. Um, one was for a project based in Croatia called Slow Light Seeking Darkness. So I listened to darkness, I thought about light pollution and did a couple of solitary sound walks at night. One in New York, where I live, uh, and there's really no darkness there, and <laughs> not any surprise, actually. Um, and the other one was at the far end of Long Island, in a place without any street lights. And I recorded the walks with my own narrations on the experience. And I also worked with some music students in Austria on um, doing night walks and related sound making. And these were performed in June in Croatia just before the wonderful experience in Catalonia with uh, <laughs> many of our friends here. Another residency I'm still on is in a primary school in New York. I'm a guest artist working with seven-year-olds using listening and sound walks to examine ecology and the climate crisis. And the third residency, again at Harvest Works, Digital Media New York, is not specifically walk related. It's an audiovisual installation called Nostalgia for the Here and Now, in which I ask people two questions. What environmental sound would you most miss if it disappeared tomorrow? And what object do you really value? Uh, what would you grab if the hurricane was coming? So the walking part of this is that I then went out and recorded the sounds that they uh, described. And I also collected objects I found in the street, which I displayed as though in very, you know, in very valuable looking boxes in uh, 
as if they were in a museum that someone from the future has made about what we value now. So that installation is currently on show until October at a place called Governor's Island um, in New York at the Harvest Works Exhibition House. And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you Thank very you. much, Viv. Um, we still have a few minutes, so I'm going to ask you a few questions. The first is that um, you have to teach us how to get all these residencies, because I think uh, lots of these people here, uh, including myself, uh, would love to uh, be paid to uh, create um, without having to worry about uh, how to make ends meet. Uh, plus, also, uh, these residencies uh, sound like a, a lot of fun. Uh, so, well, that, but that's not for now, because I'm sure that's uh, okay. going to take a lot more time than, well, unless, it's, unless there's an easy solution. Well, there is, in fact, um, a, a website of artist residences, but most of them are not paid, I have to say. Yeah. And I've done so many over the years where I've paid to do them, but weirdly mm. this year, they're all paid. <laughs> all ah, you, have, you have reached this new level. Very good. <laughs> but that, um, yeah, I'm not actually applying. Now, hmm. uh, a question about your work, on the other hand, um, uh, is that to me, it seems like um, you're doing two types of um, uh, well, I mean, sure, more, but uh, the work that you do falls in two uh, main buckets, I would argue. One is where you create work that can be easily consumed by um, uh, uh, by people everywhere, like Where Am I? Or your shadow walks, uh, the, the products of the shadow walks uh, can be listened to uh, by anyone anywhere because you publish them online. Uh, at the same time, also what you uh, mentioned in your talk just now, uh, you create installations. Uh, and you do, uh, or you facilitate kind of performative work uh, where uh, you have, you, you, well, you do performance and people have to be with you to uh, enjoy the piece. Uh, these are very different things. Uh, how, for you, do these interact with each other or maybe not at all? Uh, do they influence each other? Uh, does one uh, uh, inform the other or the other way around? How do you see the, this, this, is there friction or maybe not at all with these two uh, aspects? Oh. So it's a good question, actually. I mean, for a long time, um, I did see them as very separate. I did concerts and performances, and I also did this sort of this odd area of sound walking that people kind of put into the sound art category. And I saw myself as two different things. I was a performer and I was a sound artist. And then they, they've begun to meet. And I think they began to meet, really, when I realized that my installations don't have to only exist on their own, that, you know, there is always a sung element in them just because I'm a singer. Um, so there's no installation that doesn't really have me <laughs> singing. So what I've started doing is just taking the singing out of the installation to do live performances within it. I'm going to do that again at um, the Harvest Works one, the end of October. Um, and I do a live performance instead, which, you know, seemed at first, I thought that's really silly because it's probably not even gonna sound as good as the voice sounds in the, you know, in the installation when I'm doing it live, you know, because live things often don't. Um, but I've realized that there's a whole different level there. And, and I think well, what I'm doing now with this particular one, I can say, is I feel I've reached a very nice compromise here because I will be doing the performance in the installation. So you'll hear people telling me their favorite sounds or their favorite objects. And you'll hear me, you'll hear the recordings of the sounds and you'll see the objects. But actually what you'll hear vocally is me substituting for the sounds that I was doing. And I have to tell you the sounds that I was doing are based on the words that the people said. So basically I improvised singing <laughs> with a list of people's answers, which were lovely. You know, they were often sort of crunching snow. So they kind of give you a really nice way to sing and, uh, and stuff. But for this performance, I'm asking people who visit the installation to write down their sounds and objects. And I'm going to use those exclusively for the performance. So it will be really quite different. And because I'm an improviser, it's different anyway when I'm doing something live. That was a really long-winded answer, and I'm not sure it quite answered you, but I think I'm getting reconciled to the two. <laughs> yeah, I, well, um, well, I'll abstract, uh, I think, the answer from uh, all the things you said. But uh, what I think is uh, what you're saying is that one influences the other and the other way around. Uh, and they exist really as uh, components to uh, your creative output as a whole. Uh, 
which is a shorter answer, but that was just my interpretation, so I'm not sure if it's completely true. true. And I do still separately do concerts, I have to say. You know, I do I do huh. concerts that don't really relate at all to installation or walking or anything, um, which okay. I just tend to be quiet about in this context. <laughs> Oh, well, uh, so, uh, well, but yeah, you're in New York, so your next concert will probably not be uh, near where um, uh, I am. Uh, but uh, I think no one, well, I'm not sure where everyone is, but some of you might be in New York. So you have to post your events, uh, upcoming events, on the Walkers and Create website. Uh, thanks, Viv. Uh, I'm going to move on to uh, uh, Amanda and Kit. Uh, the floor is yours. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um... Shall we? I, I we'll just briefly say who we are and how we came together. I'm, I have spent my whole life as a musician and have, from there have moved into um, composing and sound installation art. And I also do photography and occasionally videography and whatever I can, whatever kind of vaguely creative things I can put my hands to. Um, Amanda and I met some oh, nearly 25 years ago um, whilst collaborating on a project. Uh, I was playing music in a band and we worked with two dancers, one of which was Amanda. Um, in fact, they were both called Amanda, so which was confusing. Um, and uh, so we kind of hit it off creatively at that point and then later we hit it off in other ways and we're still here, um, still hopefully being creative. And um, I'll let Amanda introduce herself. Yeah. So yeah, I'm Amanda and I started off um, as a dancer, so a, a um, contemporary dance um, and um, did as a contemporary dancer, you're a freelancer, so you do lots of different jobs, um, uh, teaching, performing, choreographing, um, uh, working in different theatre contexts as well. So dance is always a kind of like a bind to um, stage things. So I did some stage choreography as well. So, um, but yeah, um, how our practice together really started off as a, again, installation art. Um, but what brought it together more was around um, uh, working with children who are um, special educational needs and disabled, uh, working in hospitals and schools. Um, and we were working with a, an American, um, Mark Cogniglio, yeah. who has got Troika Ranch, and he's devised a piece of software called Isadora. Um, and what, what he, what, he was doing was using movement to um, uh, create sounds, visuals um, w in real time terms. And what we found that actually was that um, ch children, in particular on the autistic spectrum disorder, were able to communicate and concentrate on things that were directly in front of them that were not about relationships with other people. So um, that's some of the practice of ours. But um, mm. so that's how we got together um, and started using movement and music and um, the, in, the interaction between movement and music together and how um, those are quite interlinked a little bit. So um, and that kind of started the, the whole practice and that was maybe Oh, 15 years ago, would you say? It was, yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. And I think one of the things that I particularly became fascinated by is the way that is the profound effect almost instantly that music can have on an environment emotionally. Um, it can have a calming effect. It can have a, 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 an aggravating effect. Um, and, you know, that's led me into a lot of sort of site-specific um, sound work. And um, collision, the idea for collision and conflict kind of came out of that um, the idea we we stumbled upon echoes, um, which is the which is probably many people here are familiar with already, which is the um, geolocated sound wall that just works on your phone um, and will play things back depending on where you are. And we, the environment we live in is we live on right on Hadrian's Wall, which is a Roman wall that crosses northern England. It used to be the northern limit of the Roman Empire. Um, for a while, they ventured north of here, but then the, Sc the Scots proved too much for them, and they retreated back to here. <laughs> and, and our house is just literally on on what would have been the barbarian side of the wall, the north side of the wall, just outside the Roman Empire. And, and, and if I look out of a window over there, I'm looking at a field which would have been on the Roman side. So um, the, the wall literally ran just outside where our house is now. And um, we bring that the heritage of this natural environment that we in that we're in into a lot of our work since we moved here because it's it's really quite inspiring to us and the idea for this actually actually was pre-pandemic we just thought oh wouldn't it be wouldn't it be re interesting to use this geolocated sound walk app to um to introduce sounds as you walk through this landscape and 
we came up with this sort of idea of collision and conflict, which was based around a lot of things. There was the Romans were here. There was a wall here, which was a barrier, but also a, a, a kind of trading post. Uh, people think now it was not wasn't necessarily a, an aggressive wall. It was a sort of it was more of a trade barrier, uh, a way of controlling trade through gateways. Um, but there's been a lot of history around here since Roman times. Um, we've had the border reavers, which was a very kind of nasty, lawless time where people attacked each other's houses and all of that sort of thing. And then moving into modern times, you've got the conflict between tourists and people who are trying to manage the land, farm the land, and um, various opinions of locals versus people who want to develop things and which is just ongoing now we've we've still got a lot of conflict between <laughs> between the current artworks and and really divisive um you know some people who absolutely hate it and many people who absolutely love it which is brilliant um and so uh, the, I just touch yeah yeah also, absolutely yeah and so um the wall actually wasn't built by the romans per se mm. um the wall the wall was actually built by the roman empire and that encompasses a many many different countries um so actually the communities around here would have been really diverse um so each section of the wall would have been built by a roman um roman uh, fort and there would have been a fort close by mm -hmm. so the section that we live in would have been by, uh, built by syrian soldiers um we've got um belgian soldiers Romanian soldiers a little bit up there um, also North African um, so the communities here in Roman times would have been really diverse um, and you would have had those Roman soldiers um, connecting with local communities that lived here they would have settled and actually communities would have been uh, just uh, very different um, uh, here and so when there's this conflict between um, established people here now actually we, we haven't got diverse communities but it's so there's this conflict between um, yeah people in history and um and then also um people who walk the wall um tend to um so there's a route that you walk past and it's like 87 miles from length to length and we see lots of charity walkers go by and their heads are down and they're not engaging with the landscape they're not engaging with the people they're just walking straight ahead with their purpose in mind which is to finish the walk as quickly as possible in three days and actually they don't really can engage with the communities that are living here now so that was kind of um this walk was about to say well if you're walking hadrian's wall why don't you just stop or listen or get a deeper insight into mm -hmm. what's here what was and what could be and what the challenges are with the ecology of the site and i'll go into that a bit later yeah. so yeah that um, was the background yeah um just before i ask you to play the video back, i just so the difference i suppose between this and most of the work that we've done before is that we decided that we wouldn't make all the work ourselves on this but we, rather we, we sent out a call and commissioned um uh it, it was kind of nine um, Micro commissions. Not, yeah, nine commissions, uh, but some of which, some of them were were kind of um, uh, more than one person. So the total of fourteen artists made the nine small commissions that make up the walk as a whole, and then we sort of cur cur curated that um, just to give a background of wh about where the work came from. Um, do you think we should have a look at the video now, just to give a yeah and uh, in terms of paid we're really important mm. about we pay people yeah so um we don't we try and not ask people to do stuff for nothing because we, we want to be paid to um so mm -hmm. we actually fundraise from arts council um so arts council england um gave us a grant to do that and um, that was actually supported by northumberland national park who gave us a bit of money as a as a seed funding um and they also gave us time and in kind in terms of the rangers the ecologists um, uh, walkers, who, uh, um, people who look after the wall, um, marketing. So they allowed us to put marketing materials all across the wall as well. So they gave us time and kind in, in support mm. for that. Um, so just to give an idea about um, money and things like that. Um, and yeah, we try and pay people properly. Is that me? <laughs> yeah, because it's a lot of artists ask to do something for nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Art is so, uh, often still expected to be free. Uh, sorry, you, you want to say something else? No, it's all right. I was, you, you know, you absolutely very good, very true what you say. I'm just am going to invite invite you to play our little video clip. This is a, a there's um we we kind of as part of our um, recording process for Arts Council England and for and also for ourselves for our own archives. We we got a video uh, a, a video made which is sort of ten minutes long, which is too long for for this. But we we're, we're just going to show a kind of two minute clip to give you a taste, and we'll post a link uh, where you can watch it on YouTube if you want to see more. Wonderful a video coming up, uh, but first let me say thanks also for mentioning Echoes because I should have mentioned Echoes at the start because 
because of Echoes, we are here in this room for the attendance at least for free. Uh, Echoes is sponsoring uh, uh, today's cafe, uh, and because of that, uh, there is no cost uh, uh, for uh, attending. Uh, so, uh, Echoes, thank you. Uh, and now the video. <laughs> Collision and Conflict is a geolocated sound walk through the Northumbrian landscape along Hadrian's Wall Path. Using Echoes, an interactive GPS-triggered sound app, the collision and conflict of the landscape unfolds through music, sound, storytelling and spoken word. The artist's brief was to ensure that they embedded communities within the work, so that's either within the making of the piece or we're using some of our local families to test the piece out before it's launched. And also there'll be a community engagement workshop programme in the summer holidays when we're allowed to meet. Hello? Can you hear me? It's a strange talking to you in this way when I'm so far away. But I know exactly where you are standing. Our piece is called All Walls Must Fall and what it does is it uses where you're standing next to Hadrian's Wall as a jump off point for hearing stories of people in locations where similar walls have been built throughout the past century. So we try and use Hadrian's Wall as a reference point from which we can kind of contemplate what these walls mean because when you delve into the history it's pretty dark and so starting with a landmark which is really well known to us is a way to try and bring what's distant that bit closer and make it more relatable. We spend a lot of time messing about in the countryside, capturing sounds as raw material, and we're quite familiar with a lot of the landscape in Northumberland. So it's been great, actually. It's following a lot of the way that we've traditionally worked. So the chance to come out into a, a new landscape and explore it and sort of search for hidden, lost, forgotten, archaeological, historical sounds was very nice, you know. And I think what we've attempted to do with this is to create some kind of journey within a journey. It's a very rich set of places around here that, from our point of view, are very sound rich in particular. Thanks. Uh, just before we move on to uh, uh, Cliff, I've got one practical question. Uh, what is a charity walker? You mentioned this. Ah, so yes, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people um, walk Hadrian's Wall for a charity. Um, so there might be, um, uh, um, oh, name and charity, Oxfam or um, mm -hmm. a cancer charity or a children's charity. Um, and people get sponsored to do a task or an activity. So it might be a run or a walk. Um, so they, uh, they yeah. do mm -hmm. walk on their own free time at their own cost, um, but they raise money through sponsorship or uh, money for that. Um, and generally they're kind of more focused on the task of walking the wall than engaging with people in, in the context of the landscape. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just want to get it over with as quickly as possible because that's when they get the money. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a form of capitalism, I suppose. Um, <laughs> now, the uh, uh, the individual pieces. The, there's nine, right? So it's a bit. It's, it's a. Yeah. What's the right word for this? Uh, it's um, a, a rich, eclectic mix of uh, of individual pieces, which makes it uh, very interesting. Uh, because of, uh, no, it, they're individually good pieces, but because it's an eclectic mix, it makes it even more interesting because it's so diverse. Um, but remind me, is one of them yours or are they all commissioned? I don't recall. <laughs> They're all commissions, and what we've we ha our role was to basically um, uh, curate them, and so work with the artist to place them in the landscape. So the idea of that is that actually they um, uh, each of the pieces, and I, I totally relate to Daryl here, which is around um, making those steps, walking, finding out the artists, and working with them, um, and and that's a bit of a challenge in their their own right. Is that actually you're trying to place a, a cohesive walk around the landscape, um, stopping off. At, often piles of stones um, and how you how do you animate that or how do you find the right artist to animate that so in terms of producing and curating that was quite a challenge um, so that was my role Kit's role was more technical wasn't it yeah yeah so yes and 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 test a lot endless walking the route and walking the route and testing timings as, as we keep saying 
um, and adjusting the the order that they were in and making sure everything would fit and then in some cases negotiating a, a shortening of the work which was um, never it's not easy when because you, you you have a work that's that's it just doesn't fit because it's too long but it's all great you know and and that's there was some tough editing negotiations to be had along the way but i think you know it ended up i think we were really pleased with how it ended up yeah and and um so we had three emerging artists so they were smaller commissions um they were people who were just graduated with over two years and less mm -hmm. um, and then we had more established artists and some of um some of the the younger artists who were just starting out didn't have recording facilities so um what kit was doing was working with the artist i my rehearsal directing we got the best performance out of them there's um, poetry, prose, storytelling, um, music, uh, ambient sounds, um, and some of the artists hadn't done this before. So it's about getting. It was working with them to get the best possible take, recording. Mm -hmm. um, some had clearer ideas about what they wanted to do, um, and then Kit spent quite a lot of time cleaning things up and and making it sound cohesive as a part of a walk. So each track came in at the same level. Each. Sorry, you can talk about that. Yeah, well, you've just about said it. Yeah. Yes, exactly that. Um, I, in in some cases, we we had people around here to do some good quality voice recording because they didn't have that facility at home um, and in other cases I would do a, I would make they recorded the track but I would mix it uh, and I did a kind of a mastering job on everything as Amanda said to kind of unify it and make it sound like it all fitted together and then there was also part of this was really about engaging communities that live here already mm -hmm. so we had an engagement program where we did a sound walk with kids from the school uh, we did a poetry workshop with um, a learning disabled group um, and they did a short little walk with um, one of the poets that worked on so there were little workshops that we did with groups that perhaps wouldn't have engaged with Hadrian's Wall or got out into the landscape. Um, also the refugee, uh, Carlisle Refugee Action Group, um, we had some new Syrian families that had just arrived mm. and they came for a little day trip out mm. and um, just stayed and had a little, yeah, they were just came and had a, uh, listened to what was going on because one of our artists, Ramsey, was from Syria, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So it worked, uh, uh, it, it works on many levels. Uh, can be listen to by uh, uh, you know, someone who shows up at Adrian's Wall, or you can listen to it at home as well, although then you lose the location-based aspect. Um, mm -hmm. But also uh, you position it in the community uh, uh, very much. It's very interesting. Uh, thanks, I'm gonna move on. Uh, uh, I, I have another question, but I, it will have to wait. Uh, I'm gonna move <laughs> on to, uh, to Cliff, um, who hopefully Hello. is still with us. Yes, hey Cliff, go on, yeah. the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, nice to hear from everyone about your work. It's been very interesting so far. I um, I put a little presentation together as some visual aid to help get people keep people engaged. I guess I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, so fingers crossed for technology. Can everyone see that? Yeah, yes. Getting thumbs up. Great. All right. Um, so. This is the the sound piece that was that was involved with with what we're talking about. It was so the chronic, and I made it back end of two thousand. Cliff, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. I think your microphone is um, not uh, in perfect condition. Can you hear me? Are you? Yeah, but it, there's a bit of a uh, a reverb. Is that better? This is better. Yeah, it's a bit yeah. more subdued, but yeah, yeah, this is better. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, so the reason that I'm here today is because of Bristol the Chronic, which is it was my work that I submitted, and that was a sound piece um, made in twenty back in the twenty twenty, but actually released in twenty twenty one, in collaboration with an an organisation here in Bristol called Bricks, um, which is a kind of arts community organisation um, focused on doing community work and telling community stories. And they um, wanted to commission five artists to make a podcast and the brief was completely open and I submitted my idea and that, that's how this came about. And they sent their regards and they were really glad to see that the work had been recognized. Uh, so they are aware, I'm not, I'm not doing this behind their back. Um, but just a bit of context for the work, I think, which helps explain my approach is that in, the beginning of that year i was living in london doing my ma and i was walking to university and back over and over again doing the same walk 
and I became very interested in the mental space that you enter when you're walking and how that was really helping me deal with the other work that I was making in my studio practice, which is based around printmaking and photography. Um, and how I was really struggling with that in my studio space, but how when I would walk, I would find that my thoughts would, would work in a different way and I, I could I could conceptualize and think about what I was doing in a different way. And so I became really interested in really just focusing on walking as a process and exploring what's actually happening in my mind and thinking about whether I could document that and whether that was a valid investigation in its own right and so I did my I ended up writing my thesis on it and um, this work is Solvitor Ambulando was um, is a distillation of that thesis and it's a video work which I made because of lockdown I couldn't actually do the, the walk physically anymore so I turned it into a video piece but I'd like to stress that this and and Bristol the Chronic which I'll go on to talk about I don't see them as like um, pieces as in the sense that they're outcomes on their own. I see them really more as the sketchbook pieces, as um, as development work, as I continue on this route of, of trying to explore walking as a phenomenon and, and what that means and how I can make that into art, um, into take it into different outcomes, I guess. But going back to Bristola Chronic, the title is a direct reference to Benjamin's Berlin Chronicle, which in German is Berliner Chronik. And this work, amongst others, was uh, one of the key influences. So uh, you're probably familiar with the work. I, I don't know. I don't want to patronize anyone. But um, it's Benjamin using Berlin, the city of his childhood, to kind of in, in a way, investigate his subjective consci consciousness, his experience of that of that place, and his, and his unique history with it. Um, but as I said, there are other influences there as well. There's a lot of Sebald in there, and um, Proust, Proustian ideas, um, and subjective consciousness wise, then um, uh, people like um, uh, names escape me now. Um, Mrs. Dalloway work like that to the lighthouse. These kind of investigations of, of subjective consciousness and place were all really big influences. And what I did, the, the the structure of the work is that I kind of transposed that walk that I was talking about in London and moved it into Bristol context, which is where I live now. And I guess the, the story there is that I lived in Bristol 20 years ago and I left and I came back um, 16 years later. And it was the seed was, I guess, that Proustian idea of to true recollection only really occurs after a period of forgetting. And I'd never been back to where I actually lived in Bristol 20 years ago. Where I live now is the other side of the city from it. And I thought, what would happen if I walked from there to where I live now? What would happen along the way? What kind of things would I think about? And this was the route that I took. But this route, I should stress, I mapped it after I did the walk. The walk was very much, you know, to borrow an overused term, it was a kind of derive. I didn't plan where I was going. I just knew that I roughly had to head south. And then I went back postscript and, and documented and, and looked at where I'd been. Um, and a, a big part of what I was doing and a, a big part of what the podcast is about kind of in the, in, in the subtext is about how you, how can you, if you're interested in this process of walking and this unique mental state that you enter to try and document then that that then becomes a kind of paradox because by documenting it you're kind of interrupting it so how therefore can you document it and that's that's one of the big investigations that i'm concerned with at the moment and for this walk what i did was every so often maybe like you know just when i felt tired or like i needed a bit of a break i would just make notes about the things that i'd been thinking of in a very stream of consciousness way and not worrying too much about uh, being right or whether it was interesting i was just trying to get as much down as i could and then i would walk without any pressure of having to document until i stopped again um so that's that's bristol the chronic and that's that's what it was about and as i walk i thought and the things that i think about when i walk are the things that occupy my main my my core practice i guess that's doing walking a disservice because that is part of my practice but i guess the other half of my practice which is um based around like um babak referenced it at the beginning um ideas of identity 
being from a migrant background, what that means in in a, in a British context, um, what it means to be British, what it means to be, in my case, Portuguese, and what it means to exist in the middle somewhere, um, and being from a working class background and what that means when you're negotiating uh, certain places and trying to access certain spaces. Um, and that's where my interests lie. And so since the podcast, my with reference to my walking practice, specifically i've kind of just continued that development process and i was fortunate enough to get um, support from arts council england which allowed me to take that to the next level which was that last summer i walked from john o'groats to land's end um in one go um i guess because I wanted to spend, well, what I told them, which is the truth, um, that I wanted to spend an extended time with walking and also walking for extended periods rather than just going out for a walk for a couple of hours because I developed this idea that I became really interested in what happens to the mind when you walk for extended periods, the way I found that I was entering a different meditative space and perhaps that space could be used to heal or even transcend some of the issues some of the the trauma if that's not too loaded the term of the issues that i was dealing with in the other half of my practice um but i also wanted to use it as research so along the way i invited other artists who deal with the landscape or walking or both to come with me so that i to join me for a few days so that i could research through doing and through observation um so in the middle there for the, some of you might recognize that's that's rich Richard Long, who's obviously like a huge name in, in, in conceptual walking art and sculpture in, in the British post-war tradition. Um, but other artists as well as Emma Stibben on the left, who's a printmaker who, who wanders off into the landscape to quite remote places and documents them. So walking isn't, isn't overtly present in her practice, but it, it's part of her process. So all these different kind of approach, trying to get as many different kind of approaches in there as I can. And what I've been doing since then uh, slightly interrupted through um, you know real life uh, demands and having to work and stuff but what I've been doing is trying to reflect on that on that experience and given the ideas that I've developed around walking experimenting with how to express those in an outcome so how do I take those things that I feel and that I think about walking and this idea of um, this idea of healing that perhaps walking can give me and how do I make that into an outcome? And my outcomes are generally photographic or print or a combination of the two. So trying to think about that through printmaking. Um, and I'm interested in uh, repetitive processes, processes that can mimic or can convey the experience of walking. And one, of, one way that I'm experimenting with that at the moment, and it's very nation, I hasten to add, is through woodcuts, through relief, through this kind of um, the repetitive process of cutting the wood, almost like mimicking the, the repetitive process of putting one foot in front of the other and entering this state where you're, it is very internalized and it's very reflective. I was, I was interested in the, in the previous presentation, there was a focus on the outward of walking, of landscape and, and connecting with others whereas for me walking is very internalized it's about exploring my own internal landscape and, and trying to navigate and, and come to terms with that so how do I articulate that through a process that isn't directly related to walking itself and this is the, la the la latest piece that I, I've been working on that I just completed which was taking some of the imagery of, of the walk so going back to reference images but I wasn't actually interested in what it looked like. What I was doing was just making really small repetitive marks again to to try and replicate that that experience of walking. And I found that through doing so, I actually helped me process the, the experience that I'd had and helped me think about it in, in different ways. And that's where my work is at the moment. It, it's an ongoing research into uh, walking as a, as a process and where and how I can articulate that through through the work that I, that I make in other medium. That's the end. <laughs> Thanks, Cliff. It's uh, uh, wonderful. And this is a fascinating, it's a beautiful piece. Uh, oh, sorry. No 
I don't know, I'm, I'm now longing for it, which is also a, a good feeling. Um, <laughs> uh, one question uh, on your documentation. Um, uh, you, you, based on your presentation, you seem to move towards uh, visual representation uh, of, uh, or visual documentation of uh, uh, walking. Uh, yeah. Do you think this is indeed where you're moving towards and you're leaving the uh, um, well, the podcast, as you called it, uh, of your walk through Bristol, more like behind, or that technique, you move towards a visual representation. I don't, I don't, I don't want to say. I, I, I think I don't want to say leaving behind because I like to think that everything that I do gives me new skills, which which give me like a bigger armory with which to approach future tasks. And so I have one of the great things about I, I've made sound work before my own but not really having any skills or experience. So one of the great things about working with Bricks was that I got to work with a sound producer. So I was able to like learn quite a lot about how to make things sound less bad, basically. Um, and so that's now a skill that I have that I can bring to the table. And I always say like people always are, you know, as an artist, people always ask you, oh, what medium do you work in? But I don't think of it like that. I think about, I'm exploring certain ideas and then I pick the medium that best suit that idea rather than the other way around. So totally sound is an interest of mine. It's now part of my skill set. So I will use it in the future if that is what I feel best express what I'm exploring at that moment. That's not what I'm in right now because I've got, I'm interested in this printmaking um, area, but I'm, but I, that's, I would definitely say that I would almost definitely go back to sound just be, even just because it's it's quite it's much more democratic it's quite a de one of the great things about podcasting or, or you work in that medium was that it's so democratic like you could hand it out to people and reach quite a lot of people like much more people than would ever visit a gallery to see like a, a piece of work and they could also take it with them like some of the previous talks were talking about that importance of taking the sound work with you and when i spoke to people who had listened to the podcast or they got in touch i really liked hearing about quite a lot of people had taken it on walks, like not in a specific place that related to the podcast, but they'd listened to it whilst walking. And that kind of interaction with the work really fascinates me. So it's definitely something that I, I will use in the future, but at the moment my, my focus is slightly shifted elsewhere as I, as I work through different ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Well, I'm looking forward, to, well, also to uh, new prints, because as I said, that last one I thought was quite uh, stunning. Uh, but when I listened myself to uh, Bristol or Conic, uh, uh, I was like, well, where do I subscribe? I want to hear more. Uh, I thought it was very engaging. Uh, with, Thank you. As with all the other pieces, I really recommend everyone to listen also to um, uh, this work. Um, uh, it's very easy uh, to, uh, to download you can, or to access, access it everywhere. Um, uh, but it really, um, uh, one of the reasons why I think it, I, for me, it was interesting is because it's, uh, although it's about your experience in Bristol, uh, yeah, in Bristol, um, it's very easily, as you also hinted at, super, uh, superimposed on your own um, uh, uh, urban environment, uh, uh, because you can recognize uh, as a listener uh, aspects of your thoughts, or at least I did, uh, in my own uh, experience in the urban space. Mm -hmm. um, so, which makes it uh, relatable to me at least, uh, and um, um, uh, through that more yeah, relevant, uh, it becomes personal for the listener. Uh, thanks, Cliff. Um, so thanks all for these wonderful presentations. Really, uh, all four pieces are great. Um, uh, there's been a bit, uh, I have still a few more questions for you, but there's been a bit of a chatter in uh, the chat. Um, and some of these questions that people have posted in the chat have been answered in the chat, but the chat is not recorded. So I'm going to call out a few of you, uh, even if those questions were already answered in the chat, to ask them again and then to, uh, uh, well, discuss uh, the answers. And the first one, I think, came from um, from Andrew for Darren, Daryl. Um, yeah, uh, which, uh, Andrew, do you want to, is Andrew still with us? Andrew has left. Andrew. Okay, I'll read the question uh, and then uh, I'll have uh, uh, Daryl respond. So Andrew's question was uh, uh, whether he approached uh, his composition of um, 
the sound walk as he would an opera. Uh, that is, was it walked first and then composed? And which came first, the words or the music? Daryl. Yeah. Um, well, I would say that it was not like an opera, <laughs> but, um, but it was it was a lot of it was simultaneous. I think that I, you know, I did the walk to sort of get my own impressions of the neighborhood and use the various sites. Um, but then, um, you know, a lot of and so seeing that seeing those, it inspired uh, a lot of the spirituals that I would say, you know, that I would think about and where those might go. But I also was really informed by the stories and the narratives that I collected in the oral histories, because a lot of those were specific to individual churches. And so th that narrative would go with that church and then I would compose music for that narrative um, so that, you know, those were a couple of things that impacted impacted it. And then there was also, you know, sort of there were themes that I wanted to include in the walk. Um, that I knew I wanted to deal with and I was sort of looking for places. So in that way, I was I was looking for places on the walk to incorporate certain themes. Like I wanted to talk about the Black Panthers. Um, and so I was looking for the right, you know, sort of setting for for something like that. And, um, you know, there was a, a land, an indigenous land acknowledgement. And so sort of looking for places that might uh, include that. So I'd, I'd say it was un unlike the, co you know, composing a piece, um, uh, you know, like an opera, this was really an organic process that all, all the steps informed each other. So your next piece is going to be an opera or a sound walk? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I love that. I mean, I no, I don't think I'm writing another opera in the, in the near term, but I do like what Cliff just said about the idea of a podcast. I feel like there is something I'm thinking about, okay, is there a way that you can leave, leave something with people in the same way that you can't in a live performance? They go and it's over. But I, I do like the idea that this can be called up. The experience can be called up individually. Um, and and every time you do it, it's different. Um, so, you know, if people, whether they're listening to the walk somewhere else or whether they're actually taking the walk and, and listening to the music, each time it's going to it's going to be a different experience. I like that. Thanks. Um, then also, uh, Bob, uh, you had a, a general question, uh, but Cliff, um, more or less responded to this, but maybe uh, we can expand on that a little bit. Bob, do you want to ask your question? Well, I had a specific question to Cliff later on. Shall I ask that one? Sure. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I saw an exhibition at Hauser and Worth in London on hospital rooms where the ambience created works directly uh, with psychosis to affect mood. I'm interested, Cliff, for mental health through empathy to use the medium of walking to get as close as possible with another person, bearing in mind the limitations of projection. So what I'm experimenting with is the process uh, of uh, questioning the process of walking rather than accepting it as a process. And that's in the history of uh, fine art over the last 150 years. Um, we've questioned, i.e. in this case, working on a two-dimensional surface. And now, with walking art, as I believe, um, morphing from what, what was performance art, we've got the um, canvas now has, has moved to consciousness itself. So it's a worldwide potential exponential curve that includes seven and a half billion people. So my question to you, uh, Cliff, is um, what's the potential in, in mental health uh, for, um, um, for, for uh, as something to grasp, something that's tangible, uh, as tangible as the act of walking. If act of walking is an individual act, there's something that needs to be shared from that and grasped from that. It's a bit difficult to characterize the question, but do you get the kind of thing that I'm aiming at? I think so. I mean, um, uh, I mean I'll just tell you about what I was thinking and then hopefully you can tell me if it, if it answers the question or if it's in the right area. But I was, one of the reasons I walk is because of um, experience with my own battles of, of mental health. And perhaps, and also, and, and a big part of that comes from my mother's experience. And one of the reasons I think that she suffered so badly was maybe because of this dislocation that she, that she experienced 
and she was never quite able to adapt to. And hence, like, why walking through Britain then took on this kind of greater sim, sim, um, symbol of, of trying to adjust to, to and get to know through feeling a country that, that my mother could never quite could never quite to adapt to herself but um so mental health and walking is, is is always in the back of my mind and more recently in the front of my mind and it's i'm not quite sure how walking helps or can help but a, a big area that i've been trying to research but you know going is slow is i'm really interested in in, in like i mentioned this these this this idea of meditation repetitive meditation meditation that's led me to ideas of um within buddhist philosophy and specifically within the zen tradition of kind of using that repetitive meditation to to connect to something greater than through your own personal experience to connect to something greater than your own personal experience and, and to reassess your relationship with the world so that's where my area of interest is i hasten to add that i can't speak about it with any uh, authority or, or depth because my research is so in such a an embryonic stage but those are the those are areas that I'm looking into and where my mind kind of moves in and like I said with this idea that perhaps by by doing that I or we can leave all these I, I, concerns of identity behind and maybe connect to something a bit greater on a different level with others but that's just conjecture at this point. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, well, it does. And it's also what uh, Daryl was working with is sort of bringing the internal, the spiritual Ooh. onto an external level. So I think um, that answers it, that, that addresses it at least. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, also, um, what uh, Daryl pointed out in the chat is um, uh, if Cliff or anyone for that matter is able to come up with effective documentation, uh, it could be very impactful on an educational level. Daryl, do you want to say something about that? Um, yeah, I'm just, uh, while we're talking, I'm, uh, Cliff, I'm looking up some information about somatic therapy because I think you know, that's this sort of connection, uh, you know, you probably are aware of it, but the, a, a way of treating trauma that um, that focuses on the physiological, the body responses to trauma. And so I guess what I was thinking is that, you know, I, I think you're really onto something about the meditative and repetitive power of walking to sort of settle the mind and um, and sort of process experiences. And I was just trying to think of, well, what would be, what would be the way that, you might be able to do that in a like in a in an educational setting for you know middle school students or young young people um, that that could sort of allow them because I mean you can do it through art I mean but then you get into everybody's sort of feelings about well I'm not a good artist or I can't draw this really well and I guess I was just trying to imagine what would be processes that you that would be responses um, to what people are taking in um, that would sort of complete the loop. Um, and I mean, obviously journaling, you know, writing is one, um, but I think something that's more, that's less word based, you know, would be really like, it could be movement. Anyway, I just, I thought it was a really profound idea. And, and I was just saying that because my son um, just did this Camino in France of 500 miles and it was, and it was programmed in, in such a way as to really try and promote that kind of internal work. Um, and I, I found him coming, I mean, 17. So. I found that he came home really transformed by, I mean, they did 15 to 20 miles a day for five weeks, every single day. And uh, it was a, a life-changing experience for him. Yeah, thank you. That's very interesting. Now, I hadn't, um, I'm not familiar with that term or, or maybe I am familiar with some of the ideas, but not with the term itself. So thank you. You probably, you probably are, but if you look it up, if you look it up, you might see, there might be some connections. I don't see anything that's particularly um, movement oriented but I, I know since it's so body body connected there must be something that's that's movement oriented in that great that. thank you yeah. thanks daryl um we're 90 minutes in and we're starting to lose people uh, which is uh, yeah understandable we all have other things to do but it's also fascinating uh, our discussion so i'm going to stretch it if you are if you're all okay with it for a little bit longer but not too long of course um, uh, first of all, Simon, you, oh, you see, people are dropping like flies. 
Um, Simon, you had a question on uh, how uh, the artists uh, deal with questions of conflict. Do you want to you want to raise the question? Uh, yeah, just really simply, uh, and thank you, everyone. It's been absolutely fascinating, so rich. I love the fact that we're bringing in performance, the body, and em em embodied practice, um, and and all this kind of thing, because we are not just um, brains in a jar, are we? Um, how? Uh, yeah, particularly the Hagen's Wall, but but I think all of the projects. How how do you go out these difficult subjects? Because um, uh, if you if you go too directly, if you're too provocative, then people can just clam up. You get defence mechanisms. So is is it prolonged exposure to people to develop rapport to create traces of trust, or um, do some of the the works are they more artistic and they allude? To things rather than sort of you know being really direct well how do you feel about this is it more sort of abstract and allegorical maybe I can I can see that the Hagen Walls guys nodding because I did wonder if some of that stuff worked in a more subtle way than just gone well what do you think of these lot are they all right or not and so anyone that wants to respond to that and then um, thanks for a great evening Hi, can we can we um, just add to this that conversation if that's all right? Yeah. Um, so we had this our conversation, Simon, with um, some of our artists, um, particularly um, Bridie Jackson, who um, is a singer songwriter, and she was working with um, uh, an archaeologist, uh, Andrew Burley, who owns Vinderlander the Trust, and he's the key archaeologist there. And and basically, um, he was. It, it, there's a conflict between people who live locally and archaeology and the conflict is that the archaeologists want to retain what they have without um, taking any sort of steps in the landscape and not sh shaping it or altering it um, whereas actually farmers need to get on with their jobs and a lot of the la people on the land hate archaeology because they can't actually do their job which is a farm and so there's lots of restrictions around building and creating the right of things um, and so her work involved zooming people and collecting conversations often which were at odds to what was going to be on so we had a very long conversation about how to what do you put in what do you subtly do and this was around curating and producing and helping her shape something um, which was really interesting we also had a very long conversation with Ramsey and Olivia around their piece, um, which was at, which started off 20 minutes long, which was too long for a walking piece, and it got reduced to 10. Um, but we had a very difficult conversation around, um, you know, they wanted to be quite hard. Um, we And they had a, almost like a mini drama, um, and we had to reduce that a little bit because it couldn't sustain... 20 minutes. What we did come up with was a series of walks which looked at different facets of the problem and then as a whole if you listen to them it gives you a sort of thought process which goes oh it's that or it's that and so by just dropping in different viewpoints at different points in history or from a you know from a different viewpoint as a farmer or a, a, an archaeologist or whatever um, or where the walls meet the wall you know where there's conflict at walls you got a kind of wider point which helped shape your shape your judgment without it um forcing it down your throat i think that's what i want to say mm. yeah. yeah what do you say yeah no yeah. I, yeah I, yes very well put i think i have a follow-up question for that for kit and amanda uh, mm -hmm. with your work uh, collision and conflict um i would uh, i believe that you basically moved from being creators to curators uh, how how did that uh, how did you appreciate this shift or did you not appreciate it at all? Um, in, in, it was a it was a very um, interesting and very um, steep learning curve in some ways. Um, I think we both found it a little bit challenging to let go um, of of kind of you know, we'll make sure everything is you know up to our exacting standards by doing it all ourselves, um, which. It is a mixed bag, you know, and you can't, I think this is, I think it was really rewarding. Um, we we were overwhelmed by the responses. We we ended up um, having to reject some really good proposals, which we didn't, which was a, a particularly difficult thing that we weren't expecting. We hadn't really thought through the, the idea that we would get a lot more proposals than we could accommodate within the piece and how difficult it would be to make that selection process. So that was a massive 
uh, a massive thing for us to go through. Um, and then, uh, do you want to have anything to Yeah. Um, actually, you were going to put a piece in. Well, I we ran out of time. I was kind of, I was on the, I was on the bench, as it were. I was, I was kind of, I was, pre we were prepared for the opposite. If like we, if we're struggling for content, then I'll make something. And it quickly became clear that wasn't going to be necessary at all. Um, but having said that, as we were talking, one of the challenges, as we said earlier, was geographical and the time it takes to walk from A to B and and fitting all of the works we had. Um, there was at one point we were left with quite a gap because of the way it worked out. So I was kind of going, well, shall I make something to fit the gap? But then the way we rejigged a bit more and then we worked out and it was actually it's quite a nice a bit of a respite. Let's just have people walking to the next starting point. And that worked. We decided that just worked as it was. So I didn't make anything for that. I did end up making some filler music for the video to join the piece. There's a kind of common thread through it, but that's all. That was my contribution. So the music and the videos, kids. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I see Tamsin put in a question or a remark in the chat. I'll, I'll let you uh, mention it, Tamsin, in a second. I've got one question for Viv. Um, because you worked uh, or created, really, in so many places. Uh, I said three continents, right, uh, um, which I think is correct. Uh, have you, what in your um, uh, in your eyes what are remarkable similarities with the works that you have created in these places or how they were created or with whom you created them remarkable similarities and remarkable differences uh, that you encountered <laughs> yeah so uh, as far as differences I think that I'm thinking more about shadow walks really here um, the idea of the walk is is a different one in different places, you know, that certain countries where I've, I've walked in with people, um, it hasn't been such a daily part of their lives. However, what I would say for me, it, it, the striking thing is that when I ask people to take me on a walk that's special, everywhere, everybody knows what that is. That, you know, that I find really stunning. That, Everybody I've ever asked to take me on a special walk. I mean, they might sort of go, oh, well, it's not very interesting, you know, or it's not very beautiful walk. Um, and, you know, that's not what I'm interested in. I want it to have some significance for them. Um, and people always seem to have one. So that, that's, I guess, what has struck me most. This is at the same time uh, surprising, but actually not surprising at all. Uh, that's very interesting. <laughs> Um, well, because and, uh, it's really are you, if, sorry, you know, no, can, I mean, because really what I'm asking them is about their own history, uh, yeah. their own memories, their connections with place, and everybody, everybody has it, you know, everybody yeah, yeah. is from a particular place or has some relationship with a particular place, even if they weren't born there or, you know, many, many things that happen now. Um, but then how do you uh, gain trust uh, of these people to actually tell you about their special place? Yeah, I'm always amazed by that. <laughs> I don't know, actually. I really don't know. <laughs> I think it's, Maybe uh, you're just one of those people. I don't know that I am or not, really. I wouldn't have said I was particularly. I'm not that sociable, really. But um, but it doesn't seem to be a problem. I mean, maybe my gender helps. You know, I do sometimes think this might be mm. the only project in my life I've ever done where <laughs> being female is actually helpful because, you know, uh, people tend to think I'm, I don't know, not harmful, I suppose, not a danger. Not yeah, a threat. So well, they're willing to take me off to some place, you know, by ourselves and walking for miles and not have any problem with it. Also, I, yeah. I think there's something in people that, that wants to be listened to. I think that it's very hard to actually have that experience now of being with somebody for several yeah, hours. Yeah. They just want to listen to you. They, you know, I don't want to talk to them about me. I, I really want to know what I can about them. And I think that that's So you've something been doing this for... You've been doing this for a while, so would you say that you uh, have seen a change in this, that people actually tell you their stories more easily as we uh, get more and more, um, as you know, within society, bombarded with uh, material to consume uh, as opposed to uh, being able to tell others about our, ourselves? Have you seen it become easier for people to tell you stories? Um, it, it's always been easy for people to tell me stories. I haven't noticed any difference. You know, I, I take what you're saying, and you would expect it to be different. But actually, no. It's uh, people have always, you know, people have always had a story to tell, uh, <laughs> and they've always had a connection with a place, and they want to share it with you. 
Mm -hmm. well, that's good to hear. Uh, Tamsin, you had a remark. Um, actually, it was, yes, it was really meant to be read than spoken. Um, yes, because I'm a body worker, a somatic body worker, um, then when I walk, I'm very conscious of this, of this, um, <clears throat> this sort of mixture of disappearing into myself and into into memories and the, the, the and everything you're talking about, and at the same, and then and then coming out again back into my environment, and and so that sort of in and out, and the sense of um, of the body interacting either with itself or with um, with the environment. Um, so yeah, so take that hand for example, and his mindful walking and so on is something that I practice at the beginning sometimes just to get myself. Um, out of my head and into my body, um, these types of things are, yeah, there's lots of somatic body work um, theories, which I've, you know, which are part of my experience, which are very much uh, listening <laughs> to this conversation. Um, but also, uh, I was just, yeah, near Kelso, which is not, not so far away from Hadrian's Wall, um, there's a group of uh, activists who've been really trying to make a uh, make their points, I think, is one way of putting it to their local farmers, um, and they're and they're meeting with brick walls a lot of the time, and so now they're they're thinking of making this walk from farm to farm to farm, and so uh, it's just something I'm I'm thinking I'm going to be watching or hoping I might even be able to join in, and maybe that will will start um, to engage with conversation, to actually listen to the stories and perhaps get to the 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 nub of what can what can be done to to open up and allow for everything to be part of the picture and not just one thing or the other. So, sorry, comments rather than questions. But no, thank you so much uh, to everybody. Uh, no, it's a cafe, right? So it's totally, uh, totally fine. Uh, but thank you. Um, I've got uh, one last question that I want to ask uh, Sarah uh, because um, uh, you, as Kurt Engel, and then Mario as well, who uh, is also part of Kurt Engel New Music. Um, uh, you commissioned uh, almost a dozen pieces, uh, uh, well, I presume, like two years ago. Um, so uh, when is the next batch coming out? We are working on that. We're planning to do one um, sort of bigger one per season now. That's on our list. Uh, and have kind of a more um, focused effort, particularly because um, I think having this as a series has been cool as an introduction, but I think also including it in the season in lieu of a show at some point um, moves it from the periphery more to uh, an equal place within the work we're creating. Um, and, you know, we also just have other programming <laughs> to do in limited arts organization, um, human capital. So there's that. Uh, we were talking to a few composers who have also written, um, composed, arranged, curated sound walks already who are looking to move them to different locations um, and explore how what they've created can be applied in a new space. Um, so we're kind of looking at it from those two different directions, um, but we're not planning to limit it to Portland parks in the future. So we have a few kind of quirkier locations on the horizon too. All right, um, uh, wetting the appetite. Very good, thank you. <laughs> looking forward to it. Um, thank you all. Uh, I'm gonna leave it here because uh, uh, we're, we're almost, well, an hour and 45 minutes is really enough. Um, um, uh, particularly uh, not, of course, of course, if you're uh, in uh, Portland, where it's uh, only just noon, I think. But for some of us, uh, it's hitting 10 at 11 o'clock, maybe even. I'm looking at here. Uh, so again, thank you all very much for being here, um, uh, which, uh, of course, includes Daryl, Sarah, Amanda, Kit, Viv, and Cliff, uh, as well as everyone else who, uh, who was here. Um, for uh, those who well left early, and well they left early, so they won't hear me speak. But the video of, the, of this uh, cafe will be available in a few days. Uh, it's Soundwalk September, so um, submit your pieces if you haven't already before the end of the month to uh, uh, to be featured in next year's version of this very same cafe. If you win, of course. 
Um, there is a, if you check out Walklist and create the website, uh, there's, we're going towards 50 events, I think, uh, for the whole of September. So that's quite a lot. Uh, most of which are organized by the community, not by us. Uh, the next one that's organized by us, I believe, is on Monday. Uh, yeah, on Monday, which is called the uh, Walking Within Landscape, Words and Music. And um, this is kind of topical, I believe, because uh, it's uh, two speakers, Helen Ottaway and Ralph Hoyt. And they will talk about how uh, a composer and a poet work together to create uh, a sound piece or a sound walk. Uh, so it's also a cross-discipline. Um, yeah. Uh, well, you're very welcome to join um, and tell all your friends about it. So, again, thank you very much. And I hope to see you uh, online. And, and, well, I really hope to see you in person. But uh, uh, I'll, I'll mostly just wave from Latin America uh, to uh, the rest of the world. Um, so, uh, yeah, see you, uh, see you somewhere at some point. Thank you again. Bye-bye.